Tonight, here in Kiev, security is tighter, anxiety higher. Vivid memories on a grim anniversary. War started here precisely one year ago. Missile strikes announcing a neighbor's ambition. Vladimir Putin's Russia set to overrun Volodymyr Zelensky's Ukraine. Families quickly torn apart, fleeing by train, by car, on foot. Loved ones staying to fight. The human cost immense. Yet one year on, the attackers are stalled. The attacked, not conquered. As Canadians contend with food inflation, grocery profits are up. Companies, they have no heart. At a sensational trial, the accused takes an emotional step. I did not kill Maggie. I did not kill Paul. Did he kill his wife and son? This is The National in Kiev with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Here in Kiev, we are in the very early hours of February 24th. Almost exactly one year ago, this is when Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine. Since then, war has killed tens of thousands, displaced millions, and transformed this country and the world. So to mark the moment, the UN General Assembly voted overwhelmingly, 141 countries in favor, just six joining Russia, a resolution calling on Vladimir Putin to end the war he began. It's non-binding, of course, but symbolic. A global condemnation of the invasion and the nation responsible. As Margaret Evans shows us, in Kiev and capitals around the world, there may be talk of victory, but there's very little sign of when it will come or how. A year ago, the world was waiting to see if Vladimir Putin really would order the invasion of Ukraine. Today, the wait is to see if the Russian president will unleash yet another round of massive strikes to punctuate that anniversary. And Ukraine's allies are gathering round. In Paris, the Eiffel Tower is dressed in blue and yellow. There will be a life after this war, said the Paris mayor, Anne Hidalgo, because Ukraine will win. Down the road in Brussels, the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg was talking about two worlds, the before and the after, February 24th. If President Putin uh, uh, and Russia uh, uh, stops fighting, then the war will end, we will have peace. If President Zelensky and Ukraine stops fighting, then Ukraine will cease to exist as a sovereign independent nation. So this is not two equal parties, it's an aggressor and a victim of aggression. And here in Ukraine, people are taking stock, still coming to terms with loss and hardship and the knowledge they're about to start a second year of war. Some are more optimistic than others. We're still fighting, says Anastasia Vasilenko. Ukrainians will be free. The deputy defense minister, Hanna Malyar, held a briefing to declare Ukraine's top 10 victories of the past year, from repulsing Russian tanks near Kyiv to sinking Russia's Moscow battleship. But on the hard battlefronts in the south and east, there is a different kind of reckoning. In Bakhmut, Ukrainian soldiers are still hanging on to the city, now a moonscape of destruction, despite predictions that it would fall long before now. We don't need big losses, says a tank unit commander named Dennis. People are our main resources. As long as we don't sacrifice too many resources, we will hold on out here. Asked if things will get worse, he says the worst has already happened. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Kharkiv. It's impossible to capture the full scale of the war so far, but Ukraine has been changed maybe forever. A warning, when you truly look at this war, there are things you can't unsee. The violence of the first days and weeks sparked panic. Millions fled for safety, packing trains right out of the country. When I go sleep, I don't know if I wake up or no. The entire nation was a target. Homes, lives taken senselessly. I hope that in this moment my wife in heaven 
and everything was perfect in her life. But as Putin's blitz on Kyiv stalled and sputtered, the world marveled at Ukraine's resilience and resistance. Civilians in the crossfire running for their lives across the Irpine River. As Russia just kept on shelling. Families were torn apart, wives and little kids forced from husbands and fathers. <laughs> but after Russia's retreat from the north, the world saw its full cruelty. Bucha. Bodies lay where they were gunned down, buried in mass graves. Hundreds of people. And the war was just beginning. Horror heaped on horror. Other shallow graves. Now the ferocity all along the front, a refusal to retreat, a year of anguish forged into a hard point aimed at the enemy. As allies support Ukraine, they're trying to stifle Russia with sanctions. The EU is on the verge of announcing its 10th round of sanctions to coincide with the war's anniversary. But Breyer Stewart shows us Russia has managed to paper over the war's full price, at least so far. Remember when IKEA was open, this section of the mall was jam-packed. On his YouTube channel, Konstantin Rajkov wanted to see whether Russian malls had become full of empty storefronts. Oh, take a look at this shop right here, sneaker box. Doesn't ring a bell? No surprise. This brand didn't exist until recently. But as he strolled through, he found plenty of familiar Western brands. This store is selling Reebok products sold by a Turkish entity importing the shoes. Other new stores carry Chinese and even Belarusian brands. I'm hard pressed to find any single brand that I cannot buy in Russia at the moment. Even Apple, like you can, you can buy Apple easily, it's just <laughs> not a problem. But sanctions aren't about targeting Western brands, they're about squeezing the country's economy and constraining its ability to fund the war. That impact also mixed. 20 years ago, Vladimir Milov was serving as Russia's deputy minister of energy. Now he's living in exile, advising Western governments on how to strengthen sanctions. Uh, they will deliver the result and stop Putin after some time. They could not have had this immediate effect as many people dreamed about. While Europe is poised to unveil another package of sanctions, Milov believes the focus should be on closing loopholes. Compliance is key. Putin is very effectively circumventing the sanctions. The U.S. has warned countries, including Turkey and the UAE, that there will be repercussions if they help Russia evade sanctions. Economic front. This week, President Putin boasted that the West was failing to isolate the country's economy. But experts say cracks are beginning to show. Since December, when the oil, oil, oil embargo kicked in, we see an immediate impact on the Russian budget. Revenues from oil and gas dropped by 46 percent. And that's quite astonishing. We see an immediate impact. After the invasion began, higher energy prices cushioned the blow of sanctions. But experts believe as the year progresses, the strain on Russia's economy will be more obvious and harder for the government to dismiss. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Let's look at some Canadian stories now, beginning with Canada's largest food retailer, where profits are up again. The Loblaw Company says it earned nearly 12 percent more last quarter compared to the same time a year ago. That adjusted profit more than $500 million, up by about $60 million. Earnings at other major grocers have been up as well. That is raising eyebrows for customers who see the prices remaining high even as inflation has begun to cool a bit. Nisha Patel looks at what may be driving it all. Food prices are soaring, and Loblaw says customers are shopping more often at discount grocers. That helped boost its earnings. But at No Frills, there is still plenty of frustration. Companies, they have no heart. They always want to make the same amount or more. I do believe it costs them more, but not as much as they're extorting from people. Loblaw, along with competitors Empire and Metro, have come under scrutiny lately. All three companies insist they're not taking advantage of inflation to pad profits. 
Loblaw CEO Galen Weston says higher costs are just being passed on from suppliers, and the sticker shock could continue in the coming months. We still have over a thousand supplier requests on our desks for significant cost increases. Big food manufacturers say they're facing higher costs for labor, raw materials, and transportation. So General Mills and Nestle plan to hike prices again this year. But many consumers have directed their frustration at grocers, calling it greedflation. Whether or not um, greedflation is at play is, is really, really difficult to, to nail down. Still, some experts say 80 percent of grocery sales are controlled by five retail chains, and it's cause for concern. There is also a question mark about the role of um, market concentration and a lack of competition in driving up these food prices. The debate over whether retailers have raised prices too much is ongoing, from produce aisles to Parliament Hill. This, unfortunately, is a symptom of an overheated economy. And from the Bank of Canada governor, a warning. The companies do need to normalize their pricing behavior. That's part of getting back to 2% inflation. Businesses need to get price increases under control soon, or the central bank says it could take action, with more interest rate hikes to slow the stubborn inflation that Canadians have endured for too long. Nisha, there are a few groups uh, looking into what's going on with food prices. Can you walk us through what they're finding? Adrian, there have been ongoing parliamentary hearings now. The committee has specifically summoned the CEOs of Loblaw, Metro and Empire to explain their profits. We'll see if they actually appear. The Competition Bureau is also looking at whether there's too much corporate concentration. It's supposed to release recommendations in June. And finally, there's something that's called the Grocery Code of Conduct in the works, almost like a watchdog that many industry watchers hope will even the playing field in the grocery sector. And Adrian, for Canadians dealing with those soaring food prices, any kind of change can't come soon enough. Yeah, no kidding. Nisha, thank you. Canada's privacy commissioner and three provincial counterparts are launching a joint investigation into how TikTok gathers and uses personal information. The probe will look at whether users are providing meaningful consent the commissioner's office says the privacy of minors will be one of the main focuses since the app has so many younger users. TikTok's overall transparency is also being called into question. And Google is limiting some Canadian users from viewing news content. The company says it's just a test of a potential response to the Liberal government's online news bill. The proposed bill would make big digital companies compensate Canadian media organizations for republishing their content. Google says less than 4% of users are affected during the test, which is supposed to last five weeks. Now to health care, where the individual premiers are up to bat, looking to get their piece of a funding agreement just made with the federal government. Rafi Bujikanian shows us how. We are partners. The health care money long demanded by provinces, promised weeks ago by Ottawa, appears ready to flow. We've actually just uh, confirmed agreements in principle uh, with the four Atlantic provinces and Ontario who've said, yes, we're in. Those thumbs up signaling the first of the individual provincial agreements that will divvy up $25 billion over the next decade. Ontario is getting $8 billion. The Atlantic provinces between $288 million and $1 billion. We're going to continue to ask for more. Uh, there's no question. And uh, But we are grateful for this, uh, this money. The cash infusion is to go toward funding family health services in underserved areas like remote and rural communities, mental health access and hiring. The money is great and I think that it's really needed. The proof though will be in the pudding. Renée Ladouceur Beauchamp has been out a family doctor since her family clinic shut down in December. She's worried what that could mean long term for her chronic illnesses. My health is going to deteriorate. Um, I'm likely going to find myself having to access inappropriately uh, emergency care, um, urgent care, because I don't have any other Option. Ottawa says it expects premiers to provide action plans and goals to their constituents. What we are going to do the work right now with provinces on is sitting down with them and saying, okay, what is your target for 
access to primary care physicians? Do you want to get to 95% of your residents with primary care physicians? Are you going to be satisfied with 90 or even just 75? Five deals announced Thursday means there are eight more to be reached. The Prime Minister says he expects more announcements in the next few days and weeks. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. An accused Canadian ISIS recruiter has pleaded guilty to multiple terrorism charges. He's been in pretrial custody since 2015, and today he found out how much longer he'll be imprisoned. Evan Dyer was at the courthouse. Also, Peshtari is the only person in Canada ever accused of successfully recruiting others to join ISIS, including two Ottawa area men, Khader Khalib and John McGuire. You either pack your bags or you prepare your explosive devices. McGuire became notorious for posting videos calling on Canadian Muslims to kill unbelievers. Both men are believed to have died in Syria. Today, prosecutors read a statement from McGuire's mother saying it made her sad and angry that Peshtari would get a second chance, but her son never would. Trial delays meant Peshtari spent over eight years already in pre-trial custody, and that's one reason for the lenient sentence handed down today. Only 21 months left to serve, followed by three years probation. His lawyer says he also showed sincere remorse and has changed. Mr. Peshtari was 16 when he was first approached and groomed by radical individuals uh, who he encountered. I don't think anybody would want to be defined by their ideology that they began when they were 16 years old. Prosecutors backed the sentencing recommendation, but... We're not necessarily convinced that he's um, been rehabilitated because he was successful in doing what he was because he's a very persuasive and educated uh, individual. The problem is is that people lie. Phil Gursky worked on Project Samosa, the CSIS RCMP investigation that first put Peshtari on the radar. The bottom line is that, yes, it is possible for people to change their minds. The challenge for us, in whether it's security intelligence or law enforcement or society in general, is how do you make that determination? Peshtari certainly sounded remorseful in court today where he said he'd failed his family and the Muslim community and was ashamed of his past actions and beliefs. He also thanked the RCMP for arresting him, saying it probably saved his life. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. With Toronto Transit riders already on edge over a string of recent attacks, new figures show the spike in violence goes back years. A TTC report released today shows over a thousand violent incidents against customers in 2022. That's up almost 50% from 2021 and 2020 and up 60% from 2019. All that as ridership itself dropped through the pandemic. New research suggests that deaths and incidents involving police use of force are going up and that black and indigenous people are overrepresented. This is the work of a group of academics and advocates who tracked available data from 2000 to 2022. Here's Thomas Day. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Chantelle Moore had recently celebrated her 26th birthday. A member of the Klaukwiat First Nation in B.C., officers were called to her New Brunswick home three years ago for a wellness check. She was shot four times, becoming one of more than 700 people in Canada since 2000 who died after police use of force. She should still be here. You know, she was planning her future. You know, she wanted to become an engineer. She wanted to, you know, she wanted to do big things with her life. Figures newly compiled by university researchers and civil liberties advocates suggest a steady increase in deadly police use of force. With 69 incidents in 2022, that's more than any other previous year on record. And we might say that we have greater access to information now, but actually we don't. So that doesn't really account for why we see more. No government agency makes such comprehensive data available. The figures show black and indigenous people are disproportionately represented in police killings. We have not consistently been capturing what communities have been, say, have been saying, and we know, we know historically has been going on in communities for decades. The Black Lives Matter movement boosted global scrutiny of law enforcement, but pandemic lockdowns and stress may have something to do with it too, says this longtime officer. It's caused an elevated uh, level of, uh, of confrontation at all levels, and, and that would include the police. 
The data doesn't say how often police were found to be justified in their use of force. As for Chantel Moore, a coroner's jury ruled her death a homicide. Many of the deaths listed here, the name is simply marked unknown. Advocates view that as a grim reminder of how little information is released when Canadian police kill someone. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. A powerful lawyer accused of killing his family takes the stand to defend himself. Did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out? No, I did not. The gripping murder saga unfolding in an American courtroom. Next. Quebec says it's overwhelmed by the flow of migrants at its border. Federal parties are at odds for how to deal with it. Close the Roxham Road crossing. We need to continue to support our immigration system. Rosie and the Ad Issue panel weigh in on the debate and... A group of Ukrainians who fled the war get a moment of Canadian distraction. I enjoy that so much. That's my first time. We're back in two. Former movie mogul Harvey Weinstein was sentenced today in an L.A. court. He received 16 years in prison for rape and sexual assault. He's already serving a 23-year sentence for similar convictions in New York, though he is appealing those. In Chicago, singer R. Kelly was sentenced to 20 years for child pornography and enticement of minors for sex. That sentence will run concurrently with a 30-year sentence he got last year on racketeering and sex trafficking convictions. The 56-year-old still faces charges in some other jurisdictions. A murder trial in South Carolina is being watched very closely by people across the United States. The defendant, a father accused of killing his wife and son. Well, today the drama that's been building for days turned sensational. Katie Simpson has the story. By any standard, the testimony has been sensational. Alex Murdoch, a once prominent attorney from a long line of powerful lawyers, admitted to lying and stealing, but denied murdering his family. Mr. Murdoch, did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out? No, I did not. Murdoch is accused of killing his youngest son, Paul, and his wife, Maggie. Prosecutors allege it was part of an elaborate cover-up scheme to hide the fact he'd stolen millions of dollars from his firm and clients to fund his opioid addiction. They claim he killed for sympathy, hoping a tragedy would stop investigations into his conduct. I did not kill Maggie. I did not kill Paul. At times, Murdoch became emotional, particularly when describing seeing the crime scene on the family's hunting estate in a dog kennel. So bad. But Murdoch's credibility is in question after he confirmed he did steal to fuel his drug habit and that he lied. I wasn't thinking clearly. I don't think I was capable of reason. For nearly two years, he insisted he had not been at the scene before the murders. Now he admits this video, shot by his son, places him in the kennel about an hour before the killings. Off camera, Murdoch and his wife can be heard yelling about a dog named Bubba that caught a bird. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth! Bubba! Murdoch blamed his lies on his drug addiction. You know, oh, what a tangled web we weave, but... Once I told a lie, I mean, I told my family, I, I had to keep lying. Prosecutors want jurors to see Murdoch as a liar and will explore his admissions as they continue their cross-examination. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. After the break, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey there, my friend. Hey, Adrian, great to see you in Ukraine tonight. We are here are going to talk about closing Roxham Road. Can it be done? Conservatives are calling for the Prime Minister to implement a plan to close the Roxham Road crossing within 30 days from now. What are the politics behind the demands to close that irregular border crossing? Chantal, Althea and Andrew will join me to talk about that and more. Hi 
Bear and Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. The flow of asylum seekers across Roxham Road in Quebec has exploded, says Premier François Legault. He says it has become untenable for Quebec and is calling for the entry point to be closed. So too is opposition leader Pierre Poilier. If we are a real country, we have borders. And if this is a real prime minister, he is responsible for those borders. That is why conservatives are calling for the prime minister to implement a plan to close the Roxham Road crossing within 30 days from now. But the PM says closing that irregular border crossing is more complicated. The way to close Roxham Road is to renegotiate the safe third country agreement with the United States, which is something that we've been working on uh, for many, many, many months now. So what's to be done about Roxham Road? How are the politics of all of this playing out? Let's bring in at issue Chantilly Bear, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj. Good to see you all tonight. Um, I feel like we've had this conversation before, but we're, we're going to have it again because the numbers have peaked again, and this has obviously become an issue for uh, the Quebec Premier. Chantal, what is, uh, why, why is the Premier making this an issue right now? Is there anything that can be done here to sort of appease him or satisfy him in terms of a solution? Do you have an hour? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> the numbers uh, are by the thousands. They're not going down. It's the dead of winter. So you can imagine what is going to happen uh, once the weather gets nicer. The fact is that uh, Quebec's services, social services, uh, classe d'accueil, the classrooms where you send kids who arrive and don't speak French or English in many instances, are full at the time of labor shortages. Uh, it's not just the premier who is saying uh, we have reached capacity. It's also the mayor of Montreal. For those who live far away, uh, she is not an ideological friend of the premier. No. Uh, more to the left, and he's more to the right. Uh, the fact is that this inflow of asylum sinker, uh, seekers uh, is massively coming into Quebec. Uh, and at some point, the capacity of Quebec to find housing for them uh, in a housing crisis, et cetera, et cetera, has now been not only reached, but exceeded. Yeah, and it's not even a question of, of money at this point, because the federal government's been giving them plenty of money. It's, it's, as you say, all the other things that go with it. So, Andrew, when you hear uh, François Legault, Pierre Poiliev, and others say, we need to close Roxham Road, uh, I think lots of people are confused by that kind of rhetoric because it's not clear what you would do to close it. So what what do you think they're talking about in terms of a solution then? Well, they're, they're assuming there is a solution, first of all. And we in the <laughs> pundit trade are also in the business of providing easy solutions to things, but some problems aren't so easily resolved. And simply, you know, declaring it closed or mm -hmm. putting up a fence or what have you, uh, doesn't necessarily solve anything. The reason people go to Roxham Road is because they, 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 they know they get turned back at the regular crossings. If they know they're going to get turned back at Roxham Road, they're going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not a particularly realistic solution uh, when you have these kinds of numbers. There's obviously uh, deeper forces that are impelling people to want to take their chances of, of you know, going through an irregular crossing to get to Canada. When there's that kind of demand, it's, it's, it's hard to simply choke it off. It's not a huge deal more realistic to just simply wave your hand and say, oh, well, we'll renegotiate uh, the safe third country agreement and we'll apply it all the way across the border to every, every conceivable crossing point. Uh, not only do you have to get the Americans uh, uh, agreement to that, which is, as we've seen, is e also easier said than done, but you also have to get the, essentially the agreement of the people crossing to agree to be caught. If you're going to turn them back to the Americans, you actually have to get your hands on them. Uh, and if they know they're going to be, be caught and sent back, they may simply continue to elude our grasp on this. So, uh, they're, they're, you know, as long as you, the, the, what's really driving this is the discrepancy in the real or perceived treatment they're going to re, people are going to receive in the refugee systems between Canada and the United States. And as long as the can Canadian system is seen to be more generous or the U.S. system is seen to be more illiberal, there's going to be that uh, impetus for people to try to, to move from one country to the other. And I close by simply saying, I think this is a problem that's much more about managing it and trying to regularize it and trying to get our hands on who's coming into the country uh, rather than simply th thinking we can we can close off a 5,000 mile border. So how does the, the rhetoric then we're, that we're hearing, Althea, on, on all sides 
help us get to that point that Andrew's talking about because it, it doesn't sound like we're in solution in, in the solution uh, mode in, for anyone. Well, we could be because I think there are solutions, but I just want to go back to something that Andrew said. Yeah. The profile of the asylum seekers is changing. And you know, you compare um, January numbers 2022, there was a little over 2,000. Um, January 2023 numbers, there was about like 46, 4,700. Um, they used to be people who were coming in from Nigeria, Haitians who actually had family in Quebec. Yep. Now you may have seen those stories in early February about the city of New York actually paying uh, Venezuelan migrants a, a bus tickets to send them to Plattsburgh so they can cross that Roxham Road. And so um, you have uh, places like <laughs> New York City trying to offload their problem into Canada. And I think that is why we've seen François Legault's um, rhetoric change, because during the election, he was talking about the crisis at Roxham Road with a nationalistic lens, talking about how all these migrants were dilute, diluting the presence of French in Quebec, and this was an existential threat to the province. Now he's writing a letter uh, to the Canadians in the Globe and Mail talking about the, the things that Chantal talked about, the resources. Um, the prime minister's answer to me is not really an answer. The Canadian Association uh, for um, Refugee Lawyers has suggested that the government just look within, actually, the Safe Third Country Agreement at Article 6, which basically gives the government the right to say, well, this class of refugees, we will accept them. So um, asylum seekers who are usually denied claims in the U.S. because of the gender-based violence, Canada would say, we are welcoming you. And by saying that, they could cross at regular crossings. Mm -hmm. So they could do that for a bunch of different groups of of asylum seekers, and then you would disperse the problem across the country. Because the other issue that we're not really talking about is that Ottawa itself has failed. Having refugees or would-be refugees wait two years to get treated by the Canada Border Services Agency is, you know, is the federal government lacking in its duty? Chantal. Yes, uh, but the solution of uh, which is now become the the latest federal solution of moving people to other provinces will come to a limit. Uh, I was reading about uh, Niagara Falls, where many have now been brought uh, in hotel rooms. Well, mm -hmm. that may be fine in February. It's not tourism season, yeah. but it's not a, a situation that can last. And Althea is right. Uh, most uh, of the people who cross at Roxham Road would find good employment or decent employment in Canada, except that it takes forever to process them and to give them a work permit. Mm -hmm. uh, and over that period, you kind of leave them in limbo. Meanwhile, taking people to other provinces uh, cannot be a long-term solution. Uh, if you're going to do that, then go Andrew's route. Suspend the uh, safe third country agreement, and they will sp come in greater numbers possibly, but they will spread out at yeah. regular border crossings, and, and at least you'll get a handle on who's coming. But the one thing we saw this week through the interview that uh, U.S. Ambassador David Cohen gave to, I believe, the CBC, yeah. is that if that's a priority for the U.S., it's certainly not the message that the ambassador had. His, his, his message was, we need to take uh, the, the, we need to fix the source of the problem, i.e., why would people want to be refugees? Well, good yep. luck with that. Last, last word to you, Andrew. <laughs> I just remind people that, you know, when we talk about renegotiating the safe third country agreement or suspending it, we're presuming that it's still going to be around. Uh, but it has been challenged before the courts. It's yes. been tossed up by some courts, held up on appeal. Uh, but it's a, there's a, certainly a live possibility it could be tossed out as being unconstitutional by the courts, in which case we're back to square one. Okay, I guess we could have used an hour for that topic, but we're going to take a short break and we'll be back with another round of that issue and allegations that China has tried to influence Canadian elections. Canadians can and should continue to have faith in their institutions around this. How to stop foreign interference and what to say about it. That's next on The National. Welcome to another round of At Issue. A parliamentary committee is broadening its study of foreign interference after reports suggesting China tried to influence the outcome of the last one. Pierre Poiliev says the Prime Minister has not done enough to stop it. Justin Trudeau says Canadians can trust the democratic system. Canadians 
can and should continue to have faith in their institutions around this. And they need to know that everyone is taking this seriously. What is not serious is putting a partisan spin on this, is playing political games to try and get partisan advantage out of undermining people's confidence in our institutions. Should the government be sharing more information with Canadians? Let's bring in everybody again, Chantal, Andrew, and Althea. Althea, I'm going to start with you. I mean, I, I think there's a real concern at this point now in people's um, trust in the electoral process because of this conversation and because uh, we, don't, we don't really know what's going on. So how, how concerned are you about that and, and how concerned should the government be about that? Well, the government saying that the opposition is playing politics is a little bit much. Um, I wish that I mean, we talked about this on Friday, but I do wish the prime minister had been more clear and was being more transparent about what the government knew and when it knew it and what it did about it. Because at the moment, now we were the media are having to fill in the blanks. You know, uh, you learn through reading the last report on this panel that was struck in 2019 that they actually have a very, very limited mandate. They can only speak out publicly if they feel like something is actually threatening the in integrity of the entire election, like they feel like there is a game changer here and they must warn the public about it. Otherwise, they don't want to be like James Comey in 2016. They want to keep their mouth shut to make sure that they don't affect the outcome of the election. But instead of explaining that to the public, the prime minister is like, no, no, don't worry, there's nothing really to see here, is not, um, does not instill confidence. Chantal. For sure, it doesn't work to have the prime minister tell people that they should take it on faith, that they should have faith in the system. Mm -hmm. Just listening to it, you think, what's wrong with this picture? If Justin Trudeau is serious uh, about the perils uh, of playing politics with it. And I do believe those perils are real. Yeah. Uh, that once you start doubting the system, you start doubting the outcome of elections, and then that gets you, you know where. But yeah. if he is serious, he needs to take politics out of it. He can't be the face of the government's response telling you all is under control. Yeah. You, you would need to hear from independent voices about the state of the situation. Uh, and that's just not happening. Uh, and uh, he, he, up to a point, Justin Trudeau is playing the same game as Pierre Poilievre. They're both playing politics with the issue. Well, there, there is a committee that we'll hear from some witnesses next week, um, Andrew, some of them politicians, some of them officials. But is, is Chantal right? Do we need to hear from someone, the head of CSIS or someone who can say, here's what we can tell you and here's what we can't? Uh, yes, I mean we not we need to hear from them, and we also need to to see further investigations into the allegations that are contained in these documents. I mean the scandal in this thing keeps shifting and keeps expanding and compounding with each passing day. It was initially, uh, how dare those uh, the, the Chinese government uh, engage in this kind of scandalous behavior of not only uh, smearing uh, candidates they didn't like, mostly conservatives, uh, but also it seems clandestine, clandestinely funding by illegal means uh, candidates they did like, mostly liberal candidates. Uh, that's scandalous enough. It's scandalous that uh, this was known certainly within the, the the security services and was, you have to believe, was passed on to the powers that be in the prime minister's office. Uh, and yet not very much seems to have been either done about it or communicated about it either to the public or to the people affected. Uh, but it's now in the situation where this having come to light, uh, the Prime Minister gives these brazen answers where, uh, uh, you know, I don't think we, we fully were captured by the comments you quoted, where he was basically suggesting if you raise complaints about this, you were playing into China's hands, you were doing China's work for it. Uh, or Jennifer O'Connell, the, the, the Liberal Parliamentary Secretary mm -hmm. to the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs in committee was basically saying, well, this is, you're just being like Donald Trump if you complain about this. Well, no. It's, you know, election denialism is if you complain about uh, elections being unfair or, or lacking integrity with no evidence to support it. If you've got evidence that something bad was happening, nobody's suggesting that it compromised the whole result of the election, but there's a real possibility that, uh, you know, more than one riding was affected by this. Well, that's not denialism. That's raising legitimate concerns. And so to, to, to try and yeah. sort of brazen it out the way that yeah. they seem to be the strategy at this point, is not doing anybody any good. Ch Chantal, go ahead. Uh, 
And I don't believe a parliamentary committee is necessarily the best venue for that. And why do I say that? Because we've all seen what happens in parliamentary yes. committees. Yeah. So when I meant taking the politics out of it, I didn't mean a parliamentary committee <laughs> asking the questions to which they want the answers yeah. rather than yeah. the questions they should be asking out of independent voices. Yeah, I'm looking for answers. The other thing we should say yes. is it's, <laughs> yeah. fascinating that it's fascinating that this has come out because this would involve presumably somebody at CSIS leaking this. Mm -hmm. yes. They'd be facing very severe consequences if they were caught. They would have to have very strong reasons to be feel they had to do this. Chantal, uh, Althea, last word to you here. And can you blame them, right? Because it looks like they're not handling it at all. Um, I just want to pick up on two things. One, I think n not just the public uh, and, you know, what did the government know when did it know it? But this type of information should be actually shared with political parties. So they themselves can go and look, like when we're talking about illegal donations, um, that's something that, you know, w the internal party should be able to go look at their records sure. and see if there's anything fishy. And they would only know that if somebody actually warns them about it. So I think that's important. Um, but I, I do think that we need to add nuance to this conversation because you don't want people to leave thinking like, oh, the results of the last election was uh, was changed because China interfered. Chantal wants one last uh, one last word. Yeah. I, and and I I think the last person to convince Canadians, uh, and I do believe that the outcome of the, the last election was with the outcome that we have fair and square. Yeah. Uh, but I think the last person. To reassure Canadians that that is so is the person who won yeah. and who was said to be the person that those who interfered or tried to interfere yeah. wanted yeah. to have win. It's easy enough to say after the fact, by the way, as some Chinese diplomats are saying, oh, ha, ha, this is the outcome we wanted. That's like me saying, ha, 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 I ordered the snowstorm. Yeah, right. I'm great. <laughs> but, okay. it, but, it, but it does do damage yeah. because... Yeah. It suggests that you had a hand in the result. Yeah, yeah. You, you are great, though. We all agree on that. Okay, thank you all. Good conversation. <laughs> now I'll throw things back to Adrian, and she, of course, is in Kiev. Thanks, Rosie. The mood in Kiev tonight is quiet and tense. The curfew is in effect. No one's on the street. Everyone here is on high alert as the country marks one year since the start of the war. But for those who fled to the safety of Canada, there are some moments of joy. See, it's fun. Yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> Next, Ukrainians take on a new winter activity, a distraction from the war and something to smile about. A show of defiance in Ukraine's national colors just outside the Russian embassy in London today. Protesters armed with blue and yellow paint covered both sides of the road to mark one year of Ukrainian resistance to Russia's invasion. That solidarity stretched into the night. And crowds gathered in London's Trafalgar Square, some waving Ukrainian flags and unfurling a giant banner of support for the country, while demonstrators in Brussels set up scores of children's toys just outside EU offices. Thousands of Ukrainian children are believed to have been kidnapped by the Russians. Amidst the worry and the ongoing concern, some Canadians are making sure Ukrainians who were forced to flee can experience a glimpse of winter joy. And tonight, as we mark one year since the start of the war, that joy, that little joy, is our moment. <laughs> See, it's fun. Yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> For me, it's a personal thing because I still have family in Ukraine. I just want to help them. They are smiling. And for most of them, that's the first time ever since fleeing the war. It makes me happy. I don't know why, but it makes me happy. It's amazing nature. It's moving, it's activities. Like, uh, you know, it's uh, the best day of your life. <laughs> I enjoy that so much. That's my first time and I didn't expect that it will be such cool. I was wondering that I will fall every, every minute, every second, but it works. <laughs> they help us even with this ski, which made us very happy and uh, uh, help us to forgot uh, about the war. Walking and a little bounce. 
it's amazing and uh, kind of weird, I think. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you uh, for the first, for every Can Canadian people. I uh, will remember it uh, for whole uh, my life. So a lot of falling and a lot of fun. And as good as it is to see that fun, I think the one thing we know about people who've had to flee their homes is that all they really want to do is come home. In this case, they want to come back here to Ukraine. And as we mark the one-year anniversary of this war, unfortunately, it looks like it might be a while before that can happen. That is a national for February 23rd. We will see you again tomorrow night from Ukraine as we continue our special coverage. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night. Thank you.